Not my story, but my younger sister, in her early 20s. She was in Colorado last year and went hiking with her friend. The plan was to hike up the mountain, stop midway and camp, then finish the hike the next morning. They started their hike and stopped for a camp midway. She thought it started dumping rain that night, which meant the top would most likely be snow. The next morning, they continued their hike, but it started getting complicated. Her friend only wore Chaco sandals and not proper hiking boots as they didn't expect the snow. They stopped at a creek and were deciding if they wanted to turn back on account they weren't prepared properly. When they heard a faint, Help me. They both stood still. They heard it again. They decided to follow up the creek to the woman's voice. They got to a clearing that was covered in snow and found a woman laying in it in basic athletic clothing, leggings, a light pullover jacket, and athletic shoes. My sister said her legs were swollen, discolored, and had nasty cuts on them. My sister asked how long she had been out there, and a woman said only a few hours. My sister was like, okay, we need to get you down this mountain. The woman was like, no, I need to go up the mountain, that's where my car is parked. My sister was like, no, there is no driving access at the top of the mountain, which was a sign that this woman was confused. They got her down the mountain, and my sister just kept saying how confused this woman was. They get to the bottom, and they find this woman's car. My sister couldn't get cell service to call 911 during this. My sister tells this woman she's going to drive her to the hospital, but the woman is standing strong that she would like to just go back to her bed and breakfast. My sister takes her there while driving this woman's car. Once the woman is at the bed and breakfast, she thanks them and goes in. My sister spoke to the owners and was like, you need to call a medic. She is severely confused and not acting normal. They called a medic and transported her to a hospital. Turns out this woman is from Chicago, has low blood pressure, and it was her first time ever hiking a mountain. She was also alone. She had passed out during her hike, then it dumped snow on her. She was hypothermic and only thought she'd been out for a few hours. She was out overnight in the dark, cold and alone. I couldn't imagine the terror she must have felt. Anyways, my sister went and saw her at the hospital, and the woman thanked her for saving her life. They still keep in touch to this day. This is a long story, but it has a lot of details in it. When I was six, my babysitter was this nice middle-aged lady and her equally nice husband. My twin brother and I were always at their house in the summer and we hung out with the couple's two grandkids, another boy and a girl sibling set of similar ages. This was literally my happy place. This lady had the best movie collection for a six-year-old. It is where I saw the last unicorn for the first time as well as The Little Mermaid, The Great Mouse Detective, The First Land Before Time, and The Brave Little Toaster. And her husband was a phenomenal cook by a kid's standard. Every day was chicken nuggets and pizza day. They had kid-sized four-wheelers, a pool, a huge kid's playhouse, and a jungle gym set in their backyard. And he put on the best 4th of July show in the county for years. Six-year-old me was the happiest girl on the freaking planet. They were some of the wealthiest people in our area too. Neither of them worked, so I had no idea where the money came from, but I didn't care. One day, midsummer, the two boys were being typical boys, and the little girl and I thought they were being mean. In reality, the boys wanted to play war or something, and the girls wanted to play wedding, or something similarly stupid. She and I were sad and we refused to play with the boys. Instead, we decided to go pick flowers that grew at the edge of the forest. We thought it was baby's breath, but it was really just poison hemlock. So we are walking alone in the edge of the dense forest in the middle of Banjo Country in Southern Ohio. This was in 1990, so we weren't worried about stranger danger because we were just so far out in the country. The adults did worry about animals from time to time because the next county over had bears and mountain lions, but us six-year-olds were fearless. We ended up walking onto the neighbor's property picking these flowers when we found a break in the tree line. It was an old, well-worn path leading into the woods. For whatever reason, she and I decided to ditch our flowers and take the path into the woods to see what it led to. The path itself was unremarkable, well-worn but unmaintained as there were tree roots growing up through the path in places. We came upon a little bridge at one point. We were both a little confused about it because we were told that there were no creeks in our area, yet there was a bridge. It wasn't a particularly old bridge either, but the creek bed under it was dry as a bone. Weird. We kept going because why not? 
I'm not sure how far we walked to be on the bridge, but we ended up in a clearing with stones all around in a circle. The clearing was big enough that there was a gap in the trees that allowed the sunlight in, and in the middle of the circle was a massive stone-walled well. It was big enough that there were stairs built into the damn walls in a huge spiral. My little friend was mesmerized by the well. She found a rock and tossed it in. We never heard it hit the bottom. As we were searching for more rocks to throw in, I was rooting around in a brush by a bigger stones and actually looked at the big ones. These were not normal stones. We were in a f***ing graveyard. In the middle of the woods, far away from our adults. I remember getting chills realizing this. Moments later, my little friend got really quiet and poked me. She pointed to the edge of the clearing on the other side of the well. Thankfully, not the side we had entered the graveyard on. My little heart would have exploded. She was pointing at a dark shape standing just inside the woods facing us. We both stood up, very slowly, and stared at this dark shape. At some point, the little girl took my hand and tried to get me to leave, but I couldn't move. The fear was paralyzing. It didn't move until the clouds covered the sun and our bright, inviting clearing became slightly shadowy. Then the shape moved. It was an adult-shaped sized thing wearing long dark robes with a hood over its face. We were stupid kids, but we weren't that f***ing stupid. We both turned tail and ran as fast as our little legs allowed. My friend was faster than me because I was a little overweight as a kid, so she made it to the bridge first. I wasn't far behind her though. I looked back after we got over the bridge and that asshole was standing at the edge of the bridge. I screamed, pissed myself, and kept running. I tripped over a tree root in a path, ripping my pants and shredding my knee in a process. I scrambled up and kept running. We burst out of the trees like our hair was on fire, screaming and crying, and made a beeline for the girl's grandparents' house. Her grandfather was in the backyard, planning something and came running when he heard us. We were absolutely hysterical and nothing could calm us down. We spent hours sobbing while the grandma and grandpa got us bathed and in clean clothes and tried to soothe us. The more they said there was no one in the woods, the more hysterical we became. It took both of us months before we'd even go back onto the back deck again. Everyone was convinced we made up the story with our hyperactive imaginations, but the adults humored us, the kids not so much. The next summer, we were forced into the backyard for the annual 4th of July party. Tons of kids. They all knew our story, and one of the teenage boys called Bush. He bullied us for hours until we told him where the path in the woods was, and then he made us go with him. Cue another incident of me pissing my pants. To my utter relief, when we got to where she and I both remember the path being, there was nothing. No path. Just a very heavy growth of hemlock. We tried to wade through it, and ended up with chiggers from neck to foot, and he got in a ton of trouble for dragging us kids down there once we got back. So she and I were relieved not to go back from then on. All those kids thought we were stone cold liars. Fast forward 15 years later, my mom mentioned that the grandpa passed away a few months prior while I was off at school. I was 22 at that point and had mostly forgotten the events in the woods. I expressed my condolences and asked what happened. I mean, this guy was a friend of my mom's for 20 plus years. My mom started being evasive, so I got curious and pressed her. She said that he hung himself in her garage. And then she told me the bad part. His granddaughter, my little friend, was the one that found his body. All around him were notebooks with crazy personal writings that he had amassed over a very long time. Some dating back to the early 70s, apparently, detailing his dealings with demons and spirits and other crazy things. He had left notes for all of his loved ones. The note for his granddaughter was an apology for not protecting her from the demon at the well. And the note for his wife was an apology for leaving her as it was the only way to protect her and the other people he loved. It seemed that the explanation for their wealth was deals struck with the demons. After a few decades of these deals, they had started coming to collect on the debts the old man owed and what they wanted was for him to kill his family in payments. So he killed himself instead. It was the craziest thing I had ever heard, but it made total f***ing sense. Everyone wrote the guy off as having a serious mental health issue. They threw the journals away, buried him, and moved on. No investigations, nothing. I can rationalize everything we saw and experienced as some kind of weird psychological reaction to picking Hemlock, but that wouldn't explain how both of us had the exact same delusion though. I know what I saw was real. 
I might not remember all the details nearly 30 years later after the fact, but I remember the fear. And I still have a scar on my knee that has never faded. I'm not afraid of the woods, or the dark, or anything. But I have a very healthy respect for the dead, and I don't fuck with demon shit. When I was in Boy Scouts, my troop would always go to a camp called Camp Taquitz for our yearly summer camp. That specific year, they had had abnormal bear activity in and around the camp. It was a pretty sizable camp, but was still way out in the boonies, so an encounter with a chipmunk was just as common as it would be with a California black bear. Wildlife management was done by some crazy old gunnery sergeant that we called Gunny, so you can see the situations you might find yourself in. So anyway, I was tenting with my friend who had just joined a troop. Let's call him Jane. So James and I were sleeping in our tent in the middle of the night, probably around 1 or 2 in the morning, when I was abruptly woken up by something. Everything is dead silent, aside from a plasticky creaking sound. Then I see it. Right above my head, something was pushing the tent in so hard it became a cave-in right above my head like if someone was leaning into it with all of their weight. Except, these tents were relatively strong. You could jump on them, and you would just bounce right off. So, being the scared little 13 year old I was, I began to smack whatever it was with all of my might, while simultaneously clubbing James with my fist to get him to wake up. Mind you, James is an incredibly deep sleeper, so this in effect does nothing. Whoever or whatever it is leaning so hard that it is almost touching my head, when James wakes up from a nightmare that he was having and let out a blood-curdling 10-year-old girl being murdered in the woods type of scream. Whatever it was stopped leaning into the tent and vanished silently into the night. So for years, James, who has no recollection of the event whatsoever, and I always assumed it was a bear after the meds in my day pack. But after staffing at the camp and getting to know the lore of the grounds a little better, I think something else might have been afoot. There had been many strange happenings in and around Camp Taquitz, both paranormal and just normally unexplained. These were the usual Bigfoot and ghost stories, but older scouts and even administrative higher-ups claims to have seen things. Claims of Wendigo skinwalker hybrids. Things that look like both, but not actual hybrids. Some dead guy called Drag Thump, and a bunch of Native American myths. Taquitz have been the biggest and most active Native American program west of Oklahoma. The fact that there was no tears in the tent flap from the bear claws, and that we were far away from the bear box, and the fact that there was absolutely no sound from the supposed bear, plus the fact that it was just persistently leaning into the tent instead of just clawing at it like most bears, leads me to believe it was no yogi or smoky. It just didn't behave like bears do, and even if it was some older scouts trying to play a joke on us, they wouldn't have been heavy enough to lean that far in onto the tent and probably would have erupted into laughter right afterwards. Plus, my troop isn't like that. It's full of a bunch of mild-mannered city boys. Perfect Eagle Scout material. Everything just seems so off. I don't claim to know what it was, but I'm more than positive it was not a black bear. <laughs> 